hungry tsetse fly pumping blood out of an animal. The fly lives on nothing else, just blood. In a few seconds, it more than doubles its weight. Almost everything about the insect is peculiar, from the way it cares for its young to its remarkable high-speed flight. But the importance of the tsetse is not its unique biology, but because it carries a parasite. The parasites are called trypanosomes, or trips for short. They too are fascinating biologically, but their importance is that they devastate Africa. The trips cause a fatal disease. It's the animal version of human sleeping sickness. And it attacks all domestic animals. Most African peasants cannot keep an ox to pull a plow, cannot have manure for their soil, cannot have milk or meat. Their agriculture is limited to what human muscles can do. The tsetse and the parasite keep much of Africa trapped in a primitive agriculture. Huge areas of Africa would be ideal country for ranching, but tsetse flies live here. It would be difficult to find, for in this particular place, there are less than 10 to a square mile. But even so, a cow here would be bitten and die. There is more good ranch land in Africa than twice the total area of the United States. Africa could be the meat producer for the world. The fly belts cover the fertile, well-watered parts of Africa. Cattle can only live in the areas outside them. These cattle lands are dry, arid country. Keeping animals in them needs an intimate knowledge of the fly. A Maasai village in Kenya, on the very edge of the fly belt. The Maasai are nomads, for they must move when the flies move. They survive because they know the fly. They have a traditional knowledge that passes from generation to generation. They know that when the dry season begins, the edge of the fly belt moves south, leaving vacant for a few months good open grassland. And the Maasai follow, anxious to leave their overgrazed pasture for the untouched grass. It's the general way of life for all the cattle tribes of Africa. Across half the continent, the fly retreats in the dry season and the nomads and their cattle follow. To be forced back when the fly belts move north again with the rains. Maasai cattle. In a few weeks, the grass will turn brown and they'll need new grazing. At the foot of the hills, two miles away, there's lush grass. But there are tsetse here. Nevertheless, the Maasai will take a calculated risk and bring their cattle. They balance the cows they lose to the parasite against the cows they would lose by starvation. They know exactly what they're doing. He says that during the hard times, they'll take the cows across the river, but only at midday when it's hot. They'll be back before evening, because that's when the flies feed. Some cows will be bitten, and then they show several signs. After a few days, he'll see tears, and the glands will swell, and he'll know those cows have the disease. Well, they get several. A great deal has been discovered about the fly over the last 60 years. Its flying performance is phenomenal. It has huge wing muscles, powered by an efficient fuel, an amino acid called proline. It gets up to speeds of 15 miles an hour. For a fly, 
that's high performance. But it has a tiny fuel tank. It can fly for only two minutes, and it runs out. Then it must sit for an hour while it makes more proline from its reserves of blood. It's well known why the flies move south in the summer. It simply cannot survive heat. One hour out in the midday sun and it dies. So a fly won't venture into open country. It lives where the vegetation is thick, where it can find a cool, shady spot during the midday heat. It rests on the underside of leafy branches. It hangs there, watching. A fully fed tetsi can wait for three days before it will die of hunger. So it rests, conserves its fuel, and watches for an animal on which to feed. Experiments show that the flies take off when they see a large, dark, moving object and then make for it. They come to a moving car. They've learned that a large, moving object is likely to be an elephant or an antelope. This is one of the few ways it's possible to catch them. Drive through Tetsi country and a swarm builds up behind. Open the door and catch the ones that come in. The tetsi leads an extremely solitary life. The male and female have no way of finding each other, except when, by chance, they meet on the back of an animal. In most other insects, the females give off a sex odor, a pheromone, which attracts males from long distances. The female tetsi sex pheromone only works on contact. The males find the females by bumping themselves into anything roughly the size of a female against any other kind of fly or even a speck of dirt on the cow's back as they fly in to feed. Most of the time, it's wasted effort. But when it bumps a female, the pheromone instantly makes the male fly copulate. Copulation has been studied in detail. The flies need to mate for one full hour or the male will not produce sperm. And the female would never ovulate without this much stimulation. The female stores the sperm to use throughout her life. She only mates once. Unlike other insects, tetsi don't lay eggs. They carry their young in a uterus, feeding it from a milk teat inside. And when it's finally born, it's enormous. It's heavier than she is. Its first priority is to bury itself. It's surprising that the fly population survives. A tetsi lives for three months. In that time, she will give birth to only eight larvae. Most insects lay tens of thousands of eggs. But the tetsi strategy for reproduction is different. It puts enormous investment into every individual offspring, carrying, feeding, and protecting it till it's ready to form a pupa. It's born already filled with food, so without feeding, it immediately protects itself. Within 15 minutes, it has buried itself and begun to develop a rock-hard skin as a protection against ants or other predators. In the field, finding where tetsi females deposit their larvae is very difficult. By stripping and searching the soil under bushes like these, Dr. Van Etten of Nairobi sometimes finds as many as 100 pupae per bush. But not all bushes are equally attractive. He's been investigating what the characteristics are of the breeding site the tetsis are looking for. This is uh, one of the typical breeding sites of the species we are studying in this uh, area. Um, this kind of bush, as you have seen here around is characteristics for that and what they are looking for is the darkest places within uh, the area where they are living um, 
another aspect of the breeding sites is the low-hanging branches where from where the females drop their larvae. Looking for tetra pupae is quite laborious. Um, as soon as the female drops the larvae, it tends to crawl under the litter and then digs into the soil, as depending on the humidity, whether or not this will be deep or just on the surface. In the times of the year, like, like now, when it's rather wet, uh, tetra pupae don't tend to crawl inside the soil, but just remain on the surface, um, just under the litter. And like we find here. After 30 days, the fly inside is ready to emerge. To burst its way out, it pumps up its head, forcing its eyes apart. It uses a bubble of liquid and its eyes to dig its way to the surface. That liquid is essential to the fly for a second purpose. It needs it to inflate its wings. At this point, its survival depends upon it having enough stored food remaining to let it catch up with its first meal. This is where the fly first becomes infected with a parasite. All the game in Africa have trypanosomes in their blood, but it provokes no symptoms. Over millions of years, the native animals have evolved to live with it. That is what a parasite needs, to live with, not kill its host. The wildlife of Africa is a huge, untouchable reservoir of infection. In Tanzania, the fly belts occupy more than two-thirds of the country. If domestic cattle could be protected from the trip, this land could produce more beef than Texas. And there is a way being tried, drugs. Millions of dollars in foreign aid have been used to set up 15 large ranches in the fly belts. Together, they run half a million head of cattle. This is one of those ranches, Ruvu, near Dar es Salaam. Each ranch has a resident vet. His job is to inject every cow every three months with a drug that kills trips. But the cows are walking skeletons. The protection is not working. Of the 4,800 animals on this ranch, 95% have trypanosomiasis. 10 a month are dying. The others are chronically underweight. They should get to a slaughter weight of 600 pounds after three years but these animals weigh no more than 300. And it's the really valuable parts of the cows that are missing. There's no stake along their backs, and the big muscles on the legs aren't there. What was supposed to make a profit is making a loss. It's not that the drug doesn't work. There are simply long periods when the vet has no drugs. This was the only pack he had left. Last year, he had a four-month gap with nothing to inject. But unless the drug is given every three months, it's not effective. Ruvu is only an hour from the capital, but often the drugs don't get delivered. The basic problem is that this treatment demands more administration and organization than is generally available in Africa. But the, to have the drugs is a problem. It needs time to press the orders and you'll find that sometimes you never get the drugs. So as a result, we get more animals are dying because of the disease, because of the problem of drugs. At the present, we are now out of stock of the drugs, and therefore we are afraid maybe after two to three months, there will be a disease again. There is a country which has the disease under control. Down the center of Rhodesia is a spine of high ground, too cold for the tetsi. 
Before 1896, the fly belts in the lowland kept white colonialists out. But then came the rinder pest, the great epidemic of animal smallpox that swept through Africa and killed 95% of all the game. The tsetse population collapsed. Suddenly, the way was open for the white settlers to take their wagon trains north and settle the now fly-free land. The warrior tribes, the Matabili and the Mashona, were starving and presented no resistance. But by 1905, the wild animals started to build back, and with them came the fly. The white settlers' cattle started dying, so the Rhodesians imitated the epidemic. They eliminated the game. They had large teams of hunters to shoot everything. Game eradication worked. The fertile lowlands, which used to be fly country, became covered with huge herds of fat, high-yielding European breeds, not needing protection of any kind. In the mid-50s, the British government ordered them to stop shooting. They were told to fight the fly with DDT. But within two years, the tsetse was coming back fast. So they were allowed to shoot again but only in a network of corridors that would form barriers to the fly. Within the barriers, they were to keep the fly down with DDT. A fence marks one edge of such a barrier corridor. Along the other edge, 10 miles away, lies the second fence. The fences are to stop the big animals wandering into the corridor. For between the fences, a thousand hunters keep the 10-mile-wide corridor game-free. Without food, tetsis can neither live in them nor cross them. But there is a slight leakage. Elephant or buffalo sometimes break through both fences, reinfecting the protected land. Biologists continually monitor for areas where tetsi populations are building up, and spray teams use DDT to combat them. This is one of 60 teams that work all summer to control the fly. They use a technique first developed during colonial times in Nigeria. At the hottest times, the flies are on the side of the tree away from the sun under the low branches. They spray those resting sites and that kills most tetsi. They get through huge areas fast, for as low a cost as $50 a square mile. Spraying is not a permanent solution, but it knocks the numbers down so low that this area won't need spraying again for five years. Enough is known to control the tetsi. The problem is, techniques like this need armies of trained men and a backup organization to keep them supplied with DDT, spare parts for the sprayers to keep the fences repaired, the vehicles running, the roads open, and so on. In most of Africa, this kind of organization doesn't exist. So today, the search is for ways that will work in Africa as it is. One major project is at Tanga in Tanzania. The idea is to develop a technique that will clean up every last fly after spraying, so one treatment is permanent. The project is led by Dr. Leroy Williamson of Texas. We want to discuss briefly with you some of the results of our lab work. The point to be made this week simply is that we're having excellent successes with our pupae that are being released in the field. The rearing work here at the laboratory is going on very, very well, and you're all to be complimented for a job well done. The theory is that if a sterile male fly is the first to mate a wild female, she'll produce no young. If there are enough sterile males, the population will collapse. Here, they breed tsetse flies and sterilize them. 
There are two questions being answered by this project. One, can large numbers of flies be reared artificially? And secondly, if they can, will they compete successfully with the wild males? Mass production of the sterile flies begins with mating. There are huge problems in rearing tetsies. In captivity, the flies don't make much effort to live. This room, where the 50,000 flies are kept, has to be at exactly the right temperature and humidity, or the flies die. They feed the flies on goats, which must be calm and tranquil. If the goat kicks about, the flies don't bother to feed. They have problems because the goats learn tricks to stop the flies biting, like wrinkling their skin and jumping up and down. Keeping the 600 goats the colony uses in good condition is a major challenge in itself. The larvae are collected in trays under the racks of females. In captivity, each female only produces about four pupae during her life. So not one must be wasted. The females have to be carefully hatched and put back into the colony. But first, Males and females must be separated. The females emerge first after 30 days, the males after 31. So halfway through the 30th day, the flies that have emerged are the females and the rest are the product, male tetsi pupae. At this point, the male pupae are chilled to prevent hatching and allow a few days storage. On the day they're to be released, they are sterilized with radiation. The pupae will hatch the moment they warm up. Each release station has its own tiny quota measured out. A handful of pupae is the total production of sterile males for half a week. They're worth about a dollar each. They have to travel in a refrigerator, for if they emerged before they arrive at the release site, they'd be wasted. Unless the male takes flight as soon as its wings are dry, it doesn't develop its full flying speed and can't compete with the wild males. DRP and Fletcher, this is DRP Tonga, over. TRP Tonga, this is TRP and Quadra, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Gates. I'm leaving now with a uh, pupae shipment. So I'll be looking at you uh, in about uh, three and a half hours. TRP Tonga, clear. Okay, have a good trip. TRP and Quadra, out. It was in Texas that the sterile male technique was first developed to attack the cattle screwworm. And Williamson was one of the scientists involved. It was a major development in insect control. Compared to the tetsi, the screwworm fly was easy. Each lays half a million eggs, and sterile males can be produced by the ton. But here, after three years, they feel triumphant just to have a few ounces of tetsi pupae per week. But it's not only producing the fly that needs organization. Getting the fly out to the release stations twice a week is a big operation in itself. Two trucks and 20 men are needed to distribute the flies over the experimental area. Every mile, a team is dropped to walk six miles through the bush releasing pupae at half-mile intervals. They go in parties of three because of lions. A herdsman was mauled here just a week before. The flies have been traveling continuously for six hours since they were sterilized this morning. While they're carried on foot, they're kept cold with ice. The project began training staff three years ago to reach this climax, the release of sterile flies in the field. And now, at last, that has just begun. The pupae are covered with sand. 
And within a few seconds, before the men have gone a hundred yards, the flies come bursting out. Williamson's team hopes that their sterile males will be the answer to the problem of how to attack very low populations of flies. They hope these sterile males will find the last females that remain after an area has been sprayed. The release site was sprayed three months ago. It's enclosed by a huge cleared barrier that stretches across the country like a highway. It keeps the flies from the heavily infested bush beyond the barrier out of the experiment. Tetsis won't venture across an area that has no resting sites on it. The barrier took two years to prepare and needs 600 men just to keep it clear. It forms a square enclosing 100 square miles. This is the test tube in which the sterile and the wild males are competing. They take care to see their tiny handful of sterile flies is not swamped by tetsi from outside that would be carried by a car across the barrier. You write on your paper what species this fly is and what sex. Now here's some examples. We have a male morsitans and we have a female morsitans. Notice the genitalia. The sophistication of the experiment is that there are two different species of tetsi naturally living here. One is under attack by the release of males of that species only. The other is the control. These men measure how the fly numbers are changing. They walk about 20 miles a day, attracting tetsis and catching them. The results look extremely encouraging. Three months after spraying, the control group is climbing back fast, and the tetsi under attack is going down. Release and measurements will continue for nine months, but it looks as if the experiment has shown the technique will work. Critics of the project say it could not survive the departure of the Western scientists. They say the technique is too complex for Africa, that the breeding colony will collapse and the staff lose heart. But Williamson is positive that it will survive. We were offering our, our best and most modern technology, but in a form, in a form that can be used by people of this nation. That is to say, uh, we use simple techniques, quickly clarified by saying we feed our tetsi flies on goats, and goats are available in this country. Uh, we haven't at this stage gone to more elaborate systems of uh, artificial membranes, this sort of thing. We're embarked here on a, a fresh, a new, and to us, a totally exciting piece of research. Now let's assume in this effort, being a pioneering effort for the peoples of Tanzania, in our case, that we fail. We fail through ignorance, or we fail through lack of attention to the detail that's required in a project of this nature. If we fail, regrettably, it'll be years, a decade, maybe longer, before someone rediscovers the effort that's been made here and does it again. So I find it critical that we, in fact, give a fair test to this technique and enable us to, to offer to the people of Africa a tool which they can use for their own betterment. To the north of the Tanga project in Kenya, there's a different approach. A new and prestigious laboratory, the International Laboratory for Research into Animal Diseases, ILRAD, has just been built. Here, researchers are looking at ways to attack not the fly, but the parasite. The lab has as its goal the production of a vaccine a vaccine to stimulate the body's natural defense system against trypanosomes in the blood. That natural defense works like this. The trip begins by swimming freely among the red blood cells. At first, nothing happens. But as soon as an animal is invaded by any foreign biological cells, the immune system goes into action. The foreigner is recognized, and the animal begins to make a chemical that will stick only to the foreign cells and not to anything else. That chemical is antibody. 
It takes a couple of days, and then the antibody is produced in sufficient quantity to start clumping the trips together. The clumps grow as the trips are cleared out of the blood. A vaccine is a way of stimulating the immune system so that it is ready to produce specific trip antibody within hours, not days. But if animals do eventually produce their own antibody, why is a vaccine necessary? Why do the trips kill? Dr. Jack Doyle. When we look down a microscope and you look at a trip, um, what you don't see unless you use an electron microscope is on the outside of that trypanosome is a layer of molecules, which has a very distinct type. We call it the surface coat. Now, this surface coat is what the host recognizes when it forms antibodies to a trypanosome infection. But while the host can do this very successfully, the trypanosome is even more successful in that it simply changes its coat. And that when the host forms antibody to one population, let's call it A, B appears. It will then form antibody to B and C appears. And as of yet, we still don't know whether we can run out through the whole length of the alphabet or even more than that. But this goes on day in and day out for the length of the infection, whether it be three months in a mouse or five years in a man. The host always manages to form a response, but the parasite always beats it by changing its surface. If we could see the molecules on the surface of a trip, they would have some particular shape. The antibody fits that particular shape and by clumping them, destroys them. But while that's going on, some of the trips begin appearing with a different coat, one for which the antibody doesn't work. By the time the antibody to the new coat arrives three days later, the trip has changed again, and that keeps happening. So it might seem as if a vaccine is impossible, that the trip will always be able to evade the antibody. But there is a mysterious, unexplained fact about trips that might be a way around that. Trypanosomes of one family, one genetic type, uh, may have very many different coats as you take them out from the cattle or man or a mouse. But once you pass them through the Tetsi fly to transmit them, they all end up carrying the same new coat. This result has been found from experiments on mice. An infected fly is allowed to bite the mouse, and the trips begin with their first coat. The coat changes and keeps changing to avoid the successive waves of antibody. Then an uninfected fly is allowed to feed. It sucks up trips now in, say, their tenth coat. But when the trips from the fly's saliva are examined days later, it looks as if they have all switched back to their first coat again. That is the hope, that when a fly bites, all the trips it injects will always be switched back to a predictable first coat. If that is true, a vaccine could prepare the cow for this coat, and the trips could be killed before they have time to switch to a second coat. One of the key questions, then, is do all trips return to the same first coat? At ILRAD, they have a breakthrough in technique that may answer that. Hiro Hirumi and Jack Doyle have achieved what scientists have been trying to do for 50 years. They have succeeded in keeping trypanosomes alive in test tubes. Trips grown outside an animal are an important new tool which can answer the questions about how the trips change their coats. They can avoid the problems which have plagued this work in the past. To infect a mouse, several hundred trips have to be injected. So it's never been known if the few trips that didn't return to the original coat were intruders of a different strain or if the first coats weren't stable. But now they're able to take a drop containing just one trip and make it multiply, a family from one parent. They've watched two separate families over a year, taking samples every week and switching them back to see if they revert to the same type A coat. The result so far is maddeningly inconclusive. One family has bred true. It is stained green for 18 months its type A coat is constant. But the second family is bad news. 
It began by staining red, but after several months, it lost its original type A coat and changed to a new one. It may be only a matter of months before it's known if the type A coat of a particular strain of trips is always the same. If it is, a vaccine may be possible quickly. If not, this line of research won't lead anywhere. But ILRAD is following a second path that may lead to a vaccine. In West Africa, there are cattle which are partially resistant to the trip. They're called nadamas. If they're not bitten too often, they stay fat and healthy. But they're not very useful cattle. They're small, donkey-sized. They grow very slowly, eating large amounts of food. They've so little milk that if you take the milk, you lose the calf. And if you make them work by pulling a plow, they succumb to the trip very quickly. Some experts think they are so uneconomic they're the reason the southern Sahara is overgrazed. They consume so much and give so little, but they are resistant. And it's that resistance that's being researched. How do these animals manage to live in an area where normal cows die? What's hoped for is to unravel how the animal manages to defend itself. The Nadama's immune response is successfully coping with the trip. And if researchers can find out how it does that, it may be possible to develop a vaccine on that principle. Every week, blood specimens are air freighted away to ILRAD for analysis. The secret of the immunity may be written on the surface of the blood cells, but that's for the future. What has emerged so far is the first understanding of how trips kill. It's a macabre story. Trips damage the red cells slightly, but that has no effect at the time. As the trips change their coat and wave after wave of antibody is pushed into the blood, the antibody and the debris start to stick to the damaged red blood cells. The animal's own white cells, the scavengers that dissolve away debris in the blood, are confused. The animal eats its own blood cells, eats itself into anemia and death. In East Africa, there's an experiment which attempts to get around the problem of the parasite in a totally different way. Here, they're ranching game animals, the natural animals of Africa, which are already totally immune to the disease. In charge of the project, Brian Heath. Originally, it was decided that um, game animals had been indigenous in this area for several years, or several thousand years and that maybe they would be able to um, survive in areas which are basically unsuitable for cattle, i.e. there were too many tents to fly and there were also, it was really too dry during the dry season, the grass wasn't suitable for cattle. There have been attempts to create ranches on which the game animals stay wild, and hunters go to the bush to shoot the ones that are ready for market. But that proved wildly uneconomic. Refrigerated trucks would have to be driven into the bush to collect the carcasses if they were to be fit for sale. The first thing for Heath was to select a game animal, a wild animal which would produce enough calves in captivity to maintain the herd and would produce enough meat to sell. The animal he selected was the oryx, a small antelope with fierce horns and in the wild a fierce temperament to match. His first problem was to tame them. Within only a few weeks, they had calmed down and become accustomed to handling. This was quite unexpected. When we very first started, people said that you'd never be able to uh, domesticate oryx. People, professional trappers who'd been catching oryx said they're extremely difficult animals to rear after you'd caught them, that you'd have about 70% mortality. And that, um, you know, everyone had this impression of an oryx being completely sort of aggressive and very difficult to manage. 
and we found that, uh, in fact, it's not really true. The project has been running for seven years. In all that time, none of the oryx has shown any signs of trypanosomiasis. The productivity of the oryx was one major concern. The results are better than they could have hoped for. Although it's smaller than a cow, the oryx puts on meat at the same rate, and the meat is of very high quality. Right now, the problem is that the herds, to be manageable, have to be small. To be economic, they need herds of about 300 animals that can be managed by two herdsmen. Herds that will not fight and that will stay together on the range. So at present, the research is focused on understanding and eliminating what makes the oryx threaten each other. If careful attention is paid to the herd's social structure and age groups, the oryx can be managed and herded like cattle. They'll go out to pasture each morning and return to their paddock in the evening. The herdsmen can cope with these strange-looking animals, but they would prefer to be looking after cows. It may be that African reluctance to accept the oryx in a domestic role will be a big disadvantage to this scheme. The oryx is part of nature and not thought of as property. What is happening here is something that has not happened for 10,000 years. It could be the first new domestic animal since our ancestors chose the cow. Just inside the Rhodesian border, in the middle of the guerrilla war, lies a Tetsi research station. The men who work there are guarded constantly. They think they're on the verge of a really important breakthrough. It's a trap. It attracts tetsi flies from miles around. As they arrive, they move into the dark hole and then they crawl upwards. It could be designed to simply kill the flies, but it's more clever than that. It sterilizes them. So when they emerge from the trap, there's a bonus. The males take their sterility back to the bush to spread around. It's the product of a friendship between two very different men. One is Professor Einar Bursell, Dean of the Science Faculty at Salisbury University. And the other, a restless, inventive man, Glyn Vale, who on impulse came to Rhodesia. Uh, well, uh, people have been building traps for years, but the sort of designs they come up with, uh, I think anyway, are based largely on hunch. Uh, I mean, I've built traps like this myself. I sit down with a, a beer in the evening and I dream up something that I think might work and uh, sometimes next morning I try it and fair enough it, it does work but with this sort of hit and miss hunch type approach you can never sit down and say to yourself well this trap I've just built is the best trap and we want to say that we've got the best trap he first investigated what were the main features of a moving shape that attracted a tetsi he built models of animals to attract the fly. The black drum has roughly the appearance of an antelope. He invented the idea of covering the drum with a grid of wires at several thousand volts to electrocute the tetsi that landed on it. And he had a second net behind to catch the following swarm. He found that if no one was near the drum, many more flies were caught than if he walked beside it and many, many more flies flew in the following swarm than anyone had dreamed of. Male GT. Male GT. It seemed as if people were repulsive to flies, and he set out to find why. Was it the vertical shape? A model seemed to confirm that. It caught just as few flies as a real person. He showed that anything vertical, an oil drum on end had the same low catch. Flies avoided vertical things. So what if the figure was not vertical? Wouldn't that look like an antelope? The answer was yes, it was attractive. So he reasoned, if the fly's behavior is controlled by vision, they should come to a man kneeling. 
but they didn't. He found that flies avoided anything that smelled like a man. From the start of Tetsi research in colonial days, fly populations have had to be measured in the presence of men. He wondered what would be the number attracted to a cow if there was nobody present. Because he couldn't find a way to wind high voltage wires around a cow, he built high electrocuting nets reaching well above the level at which Tetsi's fly. At the bottom was a tray to catch the flies, electrocuted as they made for the animal. The flies came in clouds. He caught a shy species of Tetsi that had only rarely been seen before. Then he noticed that there were 10 times more flies on the downwind net than on any other. That must mean flies were being attracted by the cow's smell. Perhaps smell was as important as vision to the Tetsi in finding food. So he thought he would get rid of the animal but keep the smell. He hid it in an underground pit. The odor from the hidden cow was extracted by a fan, and an electric net was set to catch the flies. As many came for the odor alone as it come when they could see the cow. Vale had discovered that the fly would respond to a smell alone, take off, and move upwind towards it. He had a weapon against them. That was when he and Bursell hit upon the idea of the trap. The one place where the tetra fly is vulnerable is in the, in the interrelationship between uh, the fly and its host. And when Glynn found out uh, that the main component of that interaction was in fact olfactory, then we began to see that here was a place where we could somehow crack the system. Research began along two fronts. The first was to identify the smell. What was it? Which end of the cow did it come from? Odor from the rear half of the pit attracted no flies. Experiments showed that the attracting smell was in the breath, and only in the breath. Now they're trying to isolate which of the thousands of chemicals in cow's breath is the attractive component. For two hours each day, a cow's breath is collected. Different fractions are removed with various solutions and with a freezer. What the apparatus allows through is pumped into a huge, slowly inflating bag. Then the bag is taken off to the bush to test if there's an attracting smell in today's fraction of breath. If they can find the attractive chemicals, then they won't need live animals to bait their traps. They'll be able to dispense synthetic odor. Every day, different fractions of the cow breath go for testing. The smell is pumped underground to a huge net, which is swung to face across the wind. The difference between the catch on the upwind and downwind sides of the net measures how effective the smell is. Slowly, they're zeroing in on the essential chemicals. They hope they will end with finding a few, two or three simple, stable substances, which, when released, will attract flies in huge numbers. They already have the beginnings of a cow in a bottle. There was acetone in some of the fractions of breath that attracted flies. If they bubble carbon dioxide through it, this artificial cow attracts between a quarter to a third of what the real cow would bring. And that's as far as the smell work has gone to date. The second major area of research is improving the performance of the trap. For that, they've built an underground pit that hides 12 tons of cows, goats, and sheep.
The pit puts an enormous amount of smell under their control. They can attract thousands of flies to the fan on top of this stable when they want them. And this is where they're developing the trap. Well, they seem to be coming in all right, then. Yes. Could they quite a nice one up here now? Do you think we could give them a quick spray and see whether the new brushes are working properly? Yeah. Einer Bursell's job has been to develop the sterilizing system. After choosing the chemical, he had to find out how to dispense it from an aerosol can and the right dose so the flies are sterilized but not maimed. This prototype is not releasing flies but putting them into a cage for Bursell to take back to his lab. Right, up you go. Up you go. Go on. But I think that enough? Yes, I think so. Right. Look at how the flies are behaving. Right. At present, the trap collects about 40% of the flies the smell brings to its vicinity. Glenn's task is to improve on that. So the site has been equipped with an observation chamber, where they can observe how the flies behave without the flies observing them. If you're going to make the best possible trap, as we would like to think we are going to make, you must understand all the sort of uh, stimulus response situations of various stages in the response to the trap. What makes the flies, what encourages the flies to go into a hole, and what sort of things will discourage them from going back. What, uh, again, what sort of stimulus and what sort of device can you employ to rapidly get the flies up into the cone of the uh, trap that concentrates them on the sterilizer, and uh, what sort of stimulus and response situation is involved in getting them through into the retaining cage where they're going to be sterilized and really we're totally ignorant uh, on all of this sort of thing so we've got a lot of basic studies and behavior to do it's tricky is, is the fact that they don't seem to be going up as quick as no, they could be no but i'm sure we can overcome that though do you think you can put something to attract them up there some kind of pattern of light and shade or something like that I prefer the idea of some sort of netting funnel halfway up there that would sort of, once they go on up a little way, they can come back and clear the third. They are just about to begin a pilot experiment to check the overall idea. They're going to use three traps at their present stage of development to clear the Tetsi population on this island. For this pilot run, they're not going to use artificial odor, but real cows in sheds that are now being built. So we're building three houses in all, like this on the island, and the idea is that we will put three or four cows in it, collect their smell, suck it out through a pipe that goes through this hole. Uh, we have a tube coming out from the little hole in the house. Uh, it will come down under the ground and along to a point about here, a six inch tube uh, through which we suck the smell from the animals in that house and we push the smell out here, ground level, below one of our sterilizing traps. I haven't decided whether we're going to have a 12 volt fan or a 220 volt fan yet. We'll come to that one, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, in the morning, uh, the wind usually blows off in this direction along the island, uh, taking the smell, of course, with it, and it'll bring flies to our trap from that area. Usually about midday, the uh, wind changes direction, and blows off this way, and uh, actually then we'll be bringing flies from that area. And uh, we imagine that uh, in the course of several months, we'll be able to detect a decline in the Tetsi population. And uh, over a longer period, uh, we have our fingers crossed that we're going to get rid of them completely. They're confident that the experiment on the island will work. But what about the future? I think the only place that I see where we could go quite badly wrong is in our possibility of our failure to identify the active components of the smell. But even here, I don't see that this would be a complete stumbling block because at the worst, we could say, well, all right, we won't go for the ideal. We won't try to get just one single compound or three known pure compounds. We will simply condense gallons of ox smell and we will use that as, or, or a crude fraction at least of the ox smell by just evacuating a stable 24 hours a day. We could collect huge, huge amounts of material there. It wouldn't be so elegant, but I'm sure it would work. So if it were mass-produced, 
This device could go a long way towards removing the tsetse fly from Africa. It is cheap. It can be hung from a tree and would only need a visit every three months to change the aerosol can. There may still be problems, but it could be an answer to the tsetse fly. Suppose it does work, or ILRAD develops a vaccine. What would happen? Many people predict there will be an explosion of cattle. As a result, the land will be overgrazed, eroded, and ruined. It has happened often enough before in many parts of the world. The Tetsi is often called the guardian of Africa. Without it, the continent will change. The game parks may disappear as the land becomes usable cattle could replace the giraffe and the elephant. There will be some difficult choices ahead for many countries as they balance the needs of tourism, agriculture, and traditional lifestyles. The nomadic tribes may disappear if they lose their traditional winter pasture. As soon as it is made tetsi free, it's likely to be settled. For thousands of years, the fly has ruled Africa and preserved her fertile soils. By the next century, the fly will probably be gone, and Africans will at last achieve stewardship of their land. <laughs>